This week on Wealth Track, the beautiful side of wealth building, a special edition devoted to art and collectibles. Three savvy sleuths will share the secrets of collecting masterpieces without paying master of the universe prices. Next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Additional funding provided by research affiliates and the Dreamin Foundation. Hello and welcome to this special art and collectibles edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Our mission on Wealth Track is to help you build wealth in all of the investments you care about. And since your home is where your heart is, we hope to give you a renewed appreciation for some of the treasures you might already own in your home and what you might want to collect in the future. Three savvy experts have been pulled in to help you do that. Over the last two decades, interest in art and collectibles has exploded. Once the domain of a small elite group of cognoscenti, largely in Europe and the U.S., it has gone global and mainstream. The spread of capitalism in the world's developing economies has created new wealth from Seoul to Istanbul. A technology and commodities boom has created a new class of millionaires across the globe, and the accessibility of the Internet has spawned a world class of collectors. It is nearly impossible to quantify the billions now being spent annually on art and collectibles, but the world's two largest auction houses provide some insight. Both Christie's and Sotheby's are now dealing in a wide range of objects, from Star Trek memorabilia to Picasso paintings. Christie's worldwide sales have more than doubled in the past decade to $3.1 billion in 2005. Its sales of Asian art have tripled in the last five years. Meanwhile, at Sotheby's, worldwide sales have nearly doubled over the last 10 years to $2.75 billion. The secrets of collecting art, memorabilia, and jewelry are next on this special edition of Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Joining us for this art and collectibles special are three top experts. Our first guest has had a long and distinguished career with Sotheby's, the worldwide auction house. He is Hugh Hildesley. He's executive vice president of Sotheby's North and South America. He has played a role in all aspects of the auction business and is the author of really a little gem, The Complete Guide to Buying and Selling at Auction. And joining us for a return visit is appraiser and historian of popular culture, Elise LeRae. She's also one of the four co-hosts of PBS's very popular history detective series. Elise also spent more than a decade at Christie's as an auctioneer and head of its popular arts department. And another Christie's alumna and wealth track regular is Patrizia Di Carobio. She used to head Christie's jewelry department and is now a private dealer and gemologist at her own firm, Patrizia Forenzi, Inc. It's great to have you all here. Thanks so much. And thanks for coming as a newcomer, Mr. I'm delighted Hillesley. to be here. Lovely to have you here. Now, you have been dealing with collectors and collections uh, since the 1960s. And, you know, you, you've lectured all over the country, and my mom heard you in Boston a couple of years ago, said you were absolutely fabulous. What makes a great collector? The simple fact is that they have to be totally passionate about what they're collecting. It has to be an all-embracing love affair which lasts for a lifetime. So the important thing, of course, is to work out at the beginning who, what your true love is. Now, now talk about that because you have a, a SPQR, which, well, are, which are what four you, attributes for a great collector. Well, that's as you know on the Roman banners and on, even on the person hole covers that are now called in Rome. <laughs> which, which it says SPQR, well. which is a Sonatus Populusque Romanus. Right. For those who didn't do your Latin, that's the Senate and the people of Rome. But actually it was not intended for that and the Roman Empire used it for years and years and years. It actually means the four things you have to remember as a collector. Specialization. You cannot collect everything. Darn. Pat right. <laughs> right there. Oh, Unless right. your name's Medici, then right. you have a chance. Right. Uh, P is the passion. 
you've got to really be into it because you're going to live with these things and you're going to get the psychic dividend from having them around you. So you, they must be the best you can possibly find. The cue is for quality. You never make any, any compromise on quality. It's got to be the very best of whatever it is. At whatever level you're buying, it's got to be the best. And R stands for rarity. Because if you collect something that isn't rare, uh, it's not going to help you in the end. And if it isn't rare, you actually won't get a whole lot of satisfaction out of it. So I have to be careful when I give examples of those things that are not rare. But little terracotta oil lamps from 2000, 200, 2000 BC uh, are not very, they're, they're old, they're genuine, they're pretty to look at. But they're not rare. Well, every time you put a spade in the desert, hundreds of them pop up, <laughs> so they're not rare. You two would not disagree with, no. with the four rules of, uh, of collecting. But at least you're a big believer in specialization as well to build a great collection. You know, why? Well, I think you have to have a focus. As he said, you can't buy everything. And the best collections, when either they go up for auction or they're open to the public for them to view because they're sold to private institutions, are the ones that are really focused and tell a story and, and, and make people understand why that's really collectible. So I, I think focus is, is important as well as quality. They're probably the two most important things. I also think that when you start a collection, you have to research. That, right. That's a really important thing to So say. this is one of the rules that you, rule one is research what you're going to collect. Yeah, you know, a lot of times when people come to me, they say, I want to, you know, there's so much passion out there. And right. with the internet and this world right now, you can learn a lot about a lot of things. But take your time, go to Christie's, go to Sotheby's, talk to the experts, learn, read, look at, for comparables. It's very, very important when you're starting to, to become a collector. And then uh, you, you'll see at the end of the day, some of the people that have the best collections become the experts because they've learned so not much. But collecting is passion and passion is knowledge and it, together it's a lot of fun. Patricia, I'm looking at what you're wearing no. uh, this evening. Wonderful bracelet, you know, fabulous nec necklace and earrings. Do you have to specialize if, if, if you're buying jewelry? Actually, I would say no. No. That would be if Maybe you, it's an exception. Uh, maybe it's an exception. I think you can, and you get some people have collected only a certain period of time, and others have not. And I would say, again, if you buy the best, it can be all over the span of what was done. So, okay. so tell, us, tell us what you brought, what you're actually wearing. So what did wearing, that bring? And, and, and that, that kind of really apply to, to what you consider to be the rules of, of buying jewelry. Okay, so I, one thing I believe in, in buying jewelry, is buy the best. Mm -hmm. And buy, if possible, sign. So I brought one piece sign, which is this necklace, made by Cartier in 1925. And what I think is amusing about this necklace is, in jewelry, we can believe that sometimes there is intrinsic value. How much is it worth? Well, in this particular case, if we were to break the necklace and put the stones on a little tray, it would be worth a, fur, a tenth of what it's worth mm -hmm. as a piece of jewelry designed in, and made in 1925 in France. So in, in, in certain pieces, it's better to keep them the way totally, they are exactly. because of the design. And the, the design, the workmanship, right. not attainable today in the same way. And, and approximately how much would that uh, necklace cost to, to I buy? I would say probably over $300,000. All right. Mm -hmm. The earrings have a different story. The earrings are a completely different story. They are antique, so they mm -hmm. are from the 1800s. They are not signed. Very little jewelry, almost no jewelry in the 1800 was signed. And what is amusing and unusual about them, the diamonds are old cut diamonds. They are called cushion cut diamonds. The pearls are natural. Oh, so so they are not cultured. They are something that either exists or doesn't exist. You cannot produce it. It's not man-made. And what makes their value is really what they are and the fact that the seas are polluted. Mm -hmm. You cannot they don't come out of the earth anymore. They so don't there's come out the rarity of the factor. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right, and, and one final, uh, and, and those are approximately 50,000, is that? I would say probably over 100. Over 100,000? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the bracelet is, is more the, affordable. The bracelet is more gorgeous. affordable, made in the 70s, mm -hmm. and we have, you know, thinking of what is coming up next as right. far as design. And I think this today is actually totally undervalued and not looked at. It's sort of boring for today's taste, and I do believe that 10 and 20 years down the road, this is something that everyone will want. It's going to come back in fashion. And, and again, but, but why that particular bracelet? Is that signed? Is no, it, it's not no. signed. It's just well made, right. pretty, good looking, and of a certain era, which is the 70s. Right. And so today is not so fashionable, and it's definitely coming back. 
You know, you we mentioned at the start of the show that we were going to help our viewers, you know, buy old masters, not at, at master of the universe prices. Right. You told me earlier that it's still possible to do that. I think it's absolutely possible. And what you have to understand is if you go into a particular field like old master paintings, where at the top of the line you can spend 78 million on a Rubens, mm -hmm. that's not a good place to start for most of us. <laughs> right. But you need to remember that the, ma the masters who made those paintings also drew and made some wonderful drawings, also created prints. And indeed, if you are thinking about old master drawings, uh, you can get absolutely beautiful old master drawings for well under ten thousand dollars and they'll be attributed and and authentic and and very satisfying because when the when the old masters had a concept in mind they do the drawings first so there you see the fresh concept before it gets worked into a finished painting and in the case of rubens of course he had a huge studio so when you get to the finished work although it's most of it is done by the master. You can never be absolutely sure that some of his assistants weren't helping, particularly on the large commissions. So that you're still owning a work by the same hand, you're seeing the artist's first inspiration, and you're dealing at a level which is very affordable. Plus, the thing with old master drawings is as you begin to learn and become interested, you can become as specialized as the scholars and so on and so on, and you have this wonderful game of, well, who's this drawing by? Because many of them are not signed. Right. So you can buy an anonymous drawing and then do your homework and prove yourself more clever than anybody else. And once you've identified who the artist is, and then you're becoming a very serious collector, and then, then the fun begins. So uh, in most areas, particularly of the fine arts, right. you can go down from a painting to a watercolor to a drawing to a print or even to a, f a, a rare book about, you know, mm. illustrated by an artist. So don't just think in terms of the big paintings. Get to know the artist through their drawings and other things first. And so you can get all the, you get huge satisfaction. I collect drawings because I can't afford painting. Mm -hmm. I, do I love my oh, that's drawings. That's so exciting. I, I prefer yeah. conceptual artwork because I think it's the brain. You, you really get to know the artist and how they're working and what they're thinking. And, you know what the final product is, and you get to see how they're working it out. And, and I you think could eventually valued. own a Leonardo drawing still. Mm -hmm. You'd have to be pretty wealthy yeah. to do that. <laughs> but our Leonardo drawings, are, and oh, there's an exhibition yeah. on them right now, it's the mind at work right. in an absolutely fascinating way. You know, Elise, I know that you've appraised, you know, going from, from old masters to from the sublime to, you know, to the, but to the more ordinary, but, but looking back perhaps in 100 years they won't be, but you've appraised the archives of the Lucasfilms, DreamWorks, Warner Brothers, you auctioned off Judy Garland's ruby red slippers for a record $690,000 at that time. Um, you know, so, so what are the old master equivalents in, in popular culture? Well, we look for icons. Um, mm -hmm. And when you're talking about popular culture, we're talking about the memorabilia, which is a relatively young field if you're talking right. about film, television, rock and roll, sports memorabilia. So you really, the Ruby Slippers is very iconic. The Maltese Falcon is very iconic. You know, old Hollywood, things that made it, uh, you know, had historical importance. I mean, in today's world, it's kind of become this frenzy of anything that people can get that emotionally they want. But the, really, the big money are in the iconic things. And, and Patrizia, you know, is there an old master equivalent? Uh, I mean, in, in jewelry that's that's affordable, that's accessible, that's being overlooked. You mentioned that the '70s yeah. jewelry, your bracelet, is being overlooked now. Are, are, are there other? Or do you see pieces of jewelry out there, or types of jewelry, eras of jewelry that you think are really uh, being undervalued right now? I would say probably also a period goes, goes from the 40s to the 50s. Mm -hmm. Some of it is extremely in demand, and some of it is totally not in demand right now. So we see really in jewelry, it follows fashion. So right. we are in a different field than everyone else. Yeah, right. So I see again the shoes that I was wearing when I was 20, and actually I see it in jewelry too, showing up again. You know, a lot of beads suddenly are coming up. They had disappeared for a whole time. It was very hippie at some point. So we keep seeing it again and again and again. It's sort right. of following fashion. So, cuffs so are back in fashion. Cuffs. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, no one wanted a calf. You could give them away. So, so hoard your jewelry, basically. Mm -hmm. Keep it. Yes, what exactly. What about costume with your jewelry? Costume jewelry is a field I do not know as well. Definitely more and more fashionable again and very much in demand at high prices in my mind. No, which surprises me. This is what I was going to ask you because, and, and I think that you have a, a, a point too, Elise, about the fact what you wouldn't buy in popular collectibles, and that's you wouldn't buy things that are manufactured to be 
collectibles. Mm -hmm. Yes, always. Just stay away from anything that was, was, was made to be collectible. Limited editions, mass produced. Right. I mean, basically collectibles are anything that was made not to be collectible. And then usually they don't have a lot of intrinsic value, although costume jewelry it does have some intrinsic value. Right, but, 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 but because, you know, I, I look at real jewelry, I mean, re, you know, 14 karat gold, 18 karat yeah. gold, you know, real gems that I can get, and what you would pay now for costume jewelry is, I think, is outrageous. But, but I think what the costume jewelry I'm talking about right. is really old costume jewelry, mm. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. In the 20s, they used to copy this necklace right. in costume. And today, if this necklace was copied and we were to find a copy of it, it would be worth quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. And when I say quite a bit, I think between five and $10,000, which is a lot if you think it's simply glass, right? Right. So that's the type of costume jewelry I'm talking about. And then if you move further in the years, I'm talking about bacalli jewelry, right. plastic jewelry that was never meant to really have any value of collectible, mm -hmm. but was worn. People had fun with it. And now it's collectible. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the costume jewelry that's produced today to be worn today. Right. Okay. Where do you find stuff? I mean, where do you shop? There are, when, I, when I think of, we, I mentioned the internet, needless to say, there's so much available on the internet. Both Sotheby's and Christie's have online auctions now available. It, it happens. There are collectors. I mean, you know, you have estate sales, you have flea markets, you have art fairs. It just seems overwhelming. I'm, where do you go to find Well, to where do I go personally? I, I, have a, I have a rule, a personal rule, which is unpopular with the internet, I think. But I have never actually purchased anything that I haven't seen. Haven't seen, personally. right? Uh, because I believe the final part of falling in love is seeing the work of art and seeing how you respond to it. And there's no illustration, no technology that can produce that first date with this work of art. <laughs> and if you haven't got the opportunity to actually have that first, this is fantastic. I have to have it moment. Right. I think the whole process is at slight risk mm -hmm. because. You may, it may look fantastic in the catalog, it may look wonderful on the but then it finally arrives on your doorstep and, uh, oh. And it can be flat, it's right? It's not, it, well, it may be flat, but it just may not be the kind of thing that's going to get you really excited and passionate. So right. I, I, for my personal shopping, I need to see it, I need to touch it, I need to hold it, and I need to fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. Then it has to stay in my office for several months until I have the courage to take it home to my wife because <laughs> she may not share the passion of right. this picture of dogs asleep or whatever it is that I think is absolutely the best I've ever seen. <laughs> Elise, where do you look for hidden gems? Most of the time either at auction or at a show. Mm -hmm. I really like going to shows and there's a, if you, whatever collecting category you're into there's usually some really good shows and I think as you said, it's important to hold it, to feel it, to touch it. And I think it's important to talk to people. There's a lot of people at the shows that have a lot of knowledge. And I think that helps. And you need to make sure no matter what you're buying from a reputable dealer, if you're not buying from Christie's or Sotheby's, they have to be able to stand behind their product. You know, I remember the, the CEO of, of Sotheby's being on Wealth Track uh, last year and basically saying, you know, death, divorce, uh, and, and, uh, and redecorating are the three. The four Ds. The, or, right. Right, or whatever. And, and debt is another and, big and one. And debt <laughs> is another one uh, where you find collections. Where do you find collections of, of jewelry? Because I, I realize that every local jewelry store that I go to now has an estate section. Saks, the major department stores, right. have an estate jewelry section. So where, as a buyer, where do you yes, find I jewelry? Yes, I mean, well, where do you find jewelry? Where do I buy jewelry? Mm. Auction. Mm -hmm. Oh, you definitely. do? Definitely. I definitely buy at auction. Do you see it first? I mean, is, do you and feel... And I will never, I will feel totally as, as you feel. I will never buy a piece of jewelry sight unseen. Never. And I would never advise anyone to buy a piece of jewelry sight unseen. I think you have to put it on. Mm -hmm. You have to look at yourself. If you are someone who wants to buy to own it forever, you will have to wear it, see it if you like it. As a dealer, I will lend it to my clients for them to wear it, try it on, put it with their dresses, put it with the outfit they are planning to wear it with. Absolutely, there is to be a relationship between the item you are buying right. and your life. I'm very interested in what you're wearing now, so I might borrow this, <laughs> Patricia. Um, it's time for the one investment. And I asked each of you, and we do this at the end of every uh, program, is to, you know, one investment that you would recommend that, uh, that our viewers uh, consider for a long-term diversified portfolio, but in this case, collecting portfolio. So you're looking at China. I think China, the story of China is absolutely fascinating. Chinese art has been extraordinary for millennia. 
and the tradition continues. So I think the excitement and the incredible beauty of even contemporary Chinese art is something we're just beginning to understand. And the contemporary Chinese art, why? Why is that an so area much, you should have us because it's, look at? Because it's, it's wonderful, mm -hmm. it's witty, it's very much based on the tradition of Chinese calligraphy and all the earlier Chinese art. Uh, and it has a wonderful story to tell, and it is a market that is going absolutely nuts. It's so exciting, uh, because it's not only being collected by the Chinese themselves, but it's, there's a huge European following, and American collectors are also involved in collecting Chinese contemporary art. And it is... I'm, uh, I wander about our gallery every day to see what's up. Right, what's coming in. And mm -hmm. I get mildly excited about American folk art, but I mm -hmm. get really excited but. by the contemporary Asian and particularly the Chinese things because they, it is, it's extraordinarily well done. Oh, it's terrific. beautifully painted and it's thrilling to see a market that is just exploding right. with excitement. So, and I understand because you see these works and say, I get it. This mm -hmm. is absolutely extraordinary, but it's in the tradition of centuries ago. So right. they're taking this incredibly artistic tradition and putting a modern sensitivity into it, it it's, it's huge fun. You have to come to a contemporary sale All because right. Definitely it will, will just blow your mind. <laughs> at least um, overlooked art is, is what you're looking at that's, that's historical. I think daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, tintypes, historical photography, mm -hmm. I believe that our country is still very young in comparison to collect what you could collect from all over the world and historical photography really hasn't hit the high expectations that contemporary photography does. And right. not only are you buying a piece of history and you're, you could learn about the person or the town, but you're buying a very vintage piece of, of, of art as well. And I think they're extremely undervalued. And Patrizia, a signature piece you would buy, the, yeah. what, what are the attributes being well-made, being signed? Signed, certainly. Well-made. So not every single piece of jewelry which is signed, even by a very famous house, means it's beautifully made. And that has to be totally taken into consideration. So, and something you love and that you're going to enjoy wearing and using. And also secondhand, I remember that was one of second your major hand, points. Yes, totally. Because it's cheaper, I mean, basically. It, because you don't pay for the store that's been selling it right now. You buy the, much more of the intrinsic value. Right, and, and uh, again, what you're wearing, certainly are good examples yes. of, um, of, of totally. all of those things. Well, thank you so much, Hugh Hildersley. It was just lovely to have you on Wealth Track for the My first pleasure. time. I look forward to having you on again. Elise LeRae, great to have you again. Mm -hmm. And Patricia DiCarobio, thank you so much thank for joining you. us on Wealth Track. All right, at the conclusion of every Wealth Track, we give you one suggestion to help you build or protect your wealth as well. So this week's action point, know what valuables you own. We've just talked about some of the secrets of collecting wonderful things, but chances are you already own some valuable objects, at least we hope you do. Do you know which ones are the most important and what they are worth? So start by taking a tour of your home with a fresh eye, bring in a knowledgeable relative or friend or an antiques dealer you know, and don't forget your or your parents' attic, basement, or garage either. What was considered to be junk 20 or 30 years ago could be a collector's dream today. Make a list of the objects you think might be hard or expensive to replace. List them under general categories. We don't want this to be too complicated. So under art, jewelry, silver, furniture, you know, collectibles, tchotchkes. Be selective so you don't get overwhelmed. Then take a picture of each, the ones that you care about, as detailed as you can be. And I have to admit, digital photography has made this whole process a lot easier. If you haven't had your valuables insured, your first stop with the list and your picture should be your insurance agent to find out if it's advisable to get any of the items appraised, covered individually or under a fine arts policy. Now, both Christie's and Sotheby's and other reputable auction houses will also look at pictures and give you a rough auction price estimate. As any of our guests will tell you, the next step is the most time-consuming, but potentially the most fun and interesting. Elise said it, research. Libraries and the Internet are two great sources of historical and current information. There are art and antique shows, there are fairs, there are galleries and shops galore, so happy hunting. Now, before you begin your search, we want to tell you what's coming up on next week's Wealth Talk. We're going to be talking about the best financial asset mix for your portfolio with Morgan Stanley strategist and asset allocation king David Darst. And his recently published book, Mastering the Art of Asset Allocation, is the only one you will ever need to buy on that subject. Also on hand to save you taxes by year end will be the Wall Street Journal's tax columnist Tom Herman 
and we'll welcome back you Hildesley's boss, Sotheby's CEO Bill Ruprecht, who will fill us in on the global art scene and what it is telling him about the health of the world economy. And a reminder, if you missed any part of this program or you want to see it again, we are webcasting, so you can go to our website, wealthtrack.com, next week, and you can watch it online. And we also wish to welcome some more newcomers to the WealthTrack family, viewers in northeastern Oklahoma on RSU Public Television. We're glad to have you on board. That's now up to 101 stations. Until next time, make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by research affiliates and the Dreamin Foundation.